Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dorothy Roberts, and thank you, everybody, for joining us for this critical discussion. Um, this panel, entitled Building the Ivory Tower, How Institutions Benefited, will be about financial and educational institutions' connections to slavery, what is owed to those who have been harmed, and how to go about seeking redress. So I know that Ari has been, or has worked on, um, with NCOBRA on putting together uh, the slavery era business and corporate insurance disclosure. Would you be, uh, would you be willing to speak to that? Oh sure, absolutely, that's what I'm here for. Um, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I feel a little stiff right now in the room. I'd like to do a little icebreaker, is that all right? <laughs> with the group. And uh, it goes like this here. All of, if you, believe that Afri descendants of African slaves in the United States are old reparation, raise your hand. Okay, look at y'all look around, keep your hands up and look around the room. All right, next question. By a show of hands, do you believe that reparations will be in your lifetime or your children's lifetime? That's a problem. Look around the room. That's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. Look around the room. That's a problem. All right? And uh, so I just want to be able to set the reality for us that we have to have a made up mind about this thing called reparations now. Right? If you don't have a made up mind about reparations now, then, you know, you, you need to get in a class called Reparations 101. Right? And get a better understanding of why you cannot believe, why you why you won't do something to make reparations happen now. Those of you who didn't raise your hand on the second question, it's a, more likely than not, you won't do anything to make reparations uh, happen right now or in the lifetime of your children or, yeah, in the lifetime of your children. So, in your lifetime and the lifetime of your children. So, that's the problem. That has to be negotiated. Reparations need to stop we need to take re reparation away from debating and start talking about negotiating. Because right. that's the issue, right? Okay, I'm here representing the people, who, the people who are the descendants of African slaves in the United States for short days, and I may mention that over and over again. As, as a resource for this symposium, I will answer questions about Philadelphia Slavery Disclosure Law of 2005, which amended Philadelphia Code 10th edition, section 17104, entitled prerequisite to the execution of city contracts by adding a subsection entitled, and here it is, slavery, error, business, slash, corporate insurance disclosure, and financial reparations. Now that last two words, financial reparation, was something that we added to the model that came out of Chicago. Chicago was one of the first cities to have slavery disclosure laws. But that's all, all, all the corporations had to do is disclose and go about their business, right? So we said, no, no, not here in Philly, right? And so that we created this, this uh, new subsection that says essentially that after disclosure, the corporation, the insurance company, the, the business must submit a reparation financial plan, right? That's the key, that's the key language of the law. But the issue now is enforcement. The city of Philadelphia will not enforce it, right? The procurement department is supposed to be the, uh, in, written up in the, in the law, the procurement department is supposed to be the enforcer. But when we engaged them, they shifted us and said, no, it's not us. It's the treasurer of the city. So we go to the treasurer of the city. Oh, no, it's not us, right? So guess who, who has to enforce it? The citizens of Philadelphia has to enforce that law. Hopefully, the uh, outcome of this particular uh, symposium would that uh, some of the students and the deans and the law, law professors may help us to enforce that law, uh, enforce, enforce the law whereby corporations, uh, businesses, and insurance companies actually make that financial plan. Ari, how could uh, us as Penn Law students help do that? Say that again? How could we as Penn Law students help enforce Oh, this? that's a great question. <laughs> uh, and, and, 
And, and first thing is, you gotta look at some structural thing with the, with the university. The university must add some type of reparations, research, clinic, wherein the law, second year law students actually practice providing services to reparations out in the, in the community. To begin to bridge that gap between enforcement and paying reparations. The bottom line, that's everybody wanna talk about it and debate it, but when you get down to it, some enforcement has to take place. And hopefully uh, the, the law school here will put together some type of reparations clinic where uh, students can really begin to see and understand what really happened to us, the atrocities that were laid upon us, much like uh, it was already said, both by the professor and my colleague on, the, on my left. So it's important for the university to look at its own structure. And, you know, this uh, disclosure laws basically around, it deals with that bigger, broader subject called consumer protection, right? That businesses must, and corporations must disclose their predecessor involvement in slaving our people. They must dis disclose that, right? So if they must do that, then this law school, likewise, should disclose its involvement in enslaving descendants of African slaves in the United States. Because, because if I want my daughter, my daughter went to George Washington University Law School, but if she came here, if, and, and uh, then I would want to talk with her about asking the university to disclose its background, because she may very well want to go someplace else. So that's a, so, so hold on, so that's an element of fraud, right? when you don't disclose really what the deal is right. and, and what you're about, right? So the, 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 the university has to look at its own self around this fraudulent representation of the University of Pennsylvania, formerly known as Philadelphia College, where the enslavers morphed into um, presidents of universities and colleges. The master morphed into these universities. Um, Craig Stephen Wilder, Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America, America's, America's University. Let me read a quick excerpt, very quick, brief. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's basically a review done for this book. Some people call it a linear note. Here we go. The slave economy and higher education grew up together, each nurturing the other. Money from the purchase of the sale of human beings built the campuses, stocked the libraries, and swelled the endowments of American colleges. Slaves waited on faculty and students. Academic leaders eagerly courted the support of slaveholders and slave traders. Ultimately, as Wilder shows, our leading universities were thoroughly dependent on enslavement and became breeding grounds for the racist ideas that sustained it. In short, the American Academy, inclusive of the University of Pennsylvania, never stood apart from the American slavery. It stood beside church and state as the third pillar of a civilization built on bondage. Look in the mirror, folks. Look in the mirror, University of Pennsylvania. And I like, I think somebody has to have some courage. Georgetown, I talked to the president of Georgetown University. And I told him, I said, man, you, I thanked him, first of all, for his courage to do what he did, the liturgy and all that. But I said, you got to have some courage to represent the enslavers and make amends. And I say the same thing to the University of Pennsylvania. You have to have some courage, Dean, and, and begin to be on the side of the enslaved, right? So it's important for the university to do those type of things. So we know that it's not just enough to disclose what happened, right? So Yes, I just want to um, <clears throat> demystify this concept of what happened to us. I want to demystify that. <laughs> Lest we forget the United States declared war on us, enslaved us, made us chattel, legal property, public policy and states' rights ripped us from under the covering of our culture. So they took us from under the covering of God and made us property. That's the essence of it. It was all about peoplehood, 
first and foremost. Everything else, once they destroyed our peoplehood, everything else followed, right? So we got to deal with the question of peoplehood. And like uh, Dr. Waterhouse, right? He had mentioned in one of his earlier writings that what's needed to advance, to get back into court, or get back into the public space of morality is to be able to begin to, de uh, to, to identify a narrow group of people who was really affected. Because again, the access to the courts standing has been, a, has been a bar for us. So we have identified a, a peculiar people, everybody heard that term, that term before, right? And that's, those are descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States. No one else have that type of uh, history but us. So with that standing, we must use our agency to put forth, to identify our status and our standing to get redress for the enslavement of our people. It's very key that we talk about peoplehood and advocate for peoplehood because once we get our peoplehood back, once we begin to stand tall in our culture, then we have access to the courts and, and be more, more particularly can bring issues of morality into the public domain before uh, colleges and universities, corporations, financial institutions, and insurance companies. Those are the ones that we must go after in a local sort of way. We also must move the issue back into the public domain. And it should be led by institutions like the, like the University of Pennsylvania, who've had that predecessor involvement. You got to take the lead. You got to come and sit on the other side of the table. And let us talk about how to, right? Somebody in amongst you got to have the courage to do that. Just to talk to reparationists about how do we uh, correct this monstrous destruction of life, monstrous destruction of culture and human possibilities. So I hope Dean, uh, and let me get his name right. <laughs> and, and, and look, look here, I, I'm, say, I'm, 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 I'm pretty much selecting him because you know, I used to work for two deans called Gene and Edgar Kahn, and I was the uh, manager of the teaching law firm, hence my use of this, the notion of clinics and practice, right? And so, so it's, you, have, you have to, wrestle with the powers that be inside this institution if you really want to be involved with shifting uh, the perspective of people that reparations will never be paid. It will be because the people will make that decision. But I don't have the, I don't, I don't personally, in corporate don't have enough juice right now, right? But universities, colleges, financial institutions, they have to choose. So how do we make them use that for the better good, the ultimate good? That's the big battle. As I said, the courts have never been closed to us, it's just the minds have been closed. So um, recently an article was published in the Daily Pennsylvanian, it was earlier this month, um, and it was um, an independent student-run newspaper, is the Daily Pennsylvanian, and they published preliminary findings of the Penn History of Slavery Project. Penn um, has consistently said that there is no connection to slavery at this university. And um, the Penn History of Slavery Project was a group of undergraduate students who started a couple months ago researching the um, archives uh, in and around Philadelphia. And what they found was that out, they looked at 28 trustees out of 126 founding trustees. So they've, they've only scratched the surface. But out of 28 of those trustees, 20 of them held enslaved people and had financial ties to the slave trade. The university itself as an institution has not yet been implicated. But the students involved in this project are continuing their research. They're going to continue looking into what's been going on. So what could other institutions of higher education learn? I know that we kind of talked about different ways to get involved, but what could they learn? What could some of the obstacles be that they could face going to? Yeah, uh, well, look here. I don't know what those researchers were looking at, to tell you the truth. But do you know what's on the Franklin Field? 
It's an ancestral burial ground. Right? Don't, so, so it's where you get your information from, what you really want to look, look at. So it's right here on the campus of the University of Pennsylvania. So, hey, y'all, somebody got to take the leadership on the other side of the table. I'm on one side, but the other side also got to take some leadership here. And if you don't, then the public will come after you, right? And because the public is getting more and more educated about what happened to us, and they don't like it. And so to, to minimize the tensions, the president of this college must come forth, encourage its professors to engage with in COBRA and talk about negotiating ways and means that we can solve this problem. We can't do it in two hours. Can't do it in an hour. But we, it's got to be ongoing negotiations, right? It must be done in, with some ethics involved, some morality involved, and we can solve the problem. But hey, if y'all don't come forward, stand a hand across the table, we're going to be going around this circle over and over again. And uh, that's not good because soon, just like the abolitionist John Brown took upon himself to do some radical uh, action, uh, the descendants of of African enslaved in the United States will likely do the same thing. Uh, Ari, are there any obstacles that you faced when you were bringing about the uh, slave era codes here in Philadelphia that could translate or that you would like to talk about? <clears throat> well, you know, it started in 2005. I mean, it started a little bit before 2005. The law got in place in 2005. And nothing has happened since then. So it's the the running away from the law itself by the elected officials, the city proper, right? So we have to, and we will continue to deal with the city now, and we, and we will move, make some enforcement moves ourselves. But why do we have to do that alone is the question. And uh, so University of Pennsylvania, as I continue to raise that name, needs to come out of its our ivory tower, right? And engage themselves with reparationists to close that circle of abolition. You know, there was a group of folks calling themselves abolitionists, right? But now, in this day, we must, the reparationists must close the circle and repair the damage. And that is what I put on the table of this university. Well, contemporarily speaking, let's start with my mother and my father, and her mother and her father. We have a family album. We can identify all of them, right? And so what we need is a louder voice to uh, push back on that loud voice out there that's saying that we'll never pay reparations. In fact, Wachovia Bank, in its, disclosure, in its disclosure statement, Said, we're never, we're not going to pay reparations, pure and simple. And that's a very arrogant attitude, of course. But again, we look at the contemporary vestiges of slavery. Look how mass incarceration has affected, every, affected our people. Look at how drugs have affected our people. Look at the denial of education has affected our people over time. So. I would like to bring a case where it involved these 70 year olds, 80 year olds, 90 year olds, right? We have to go all the way back to the 1800s, 1700s. Just look at the day. In fact, I, would, I hope to be, I'm 70 years old, right? So I'm going to bring it. You know, right? So there you go. It's right here in front of us. We just got to look at it and make up, have a made up mind that we're going to do something to change it. That's the first step. Then we move in and continue to uh, file the lawsuits, engage in public discussion and debate uh, about negotiating the deal. Yeah, generational trauma. Yeah, but, right, generational trauma. That's current day, right? It's about community economic development. It's more than a check. It's about community economic development, human capital development. So you're the one who wrote this, or anybody else who might be interested? You know, um, I think that um, there must be some targeting 
of some the resources and that targeting of those reparation resources into those commissions must be must deal with human capital development. That's what was destroyed in our people, right? All those types of things that make people whole again, make them feel good about who they are, right? And be recognized on an even scale like everyone else. So if we can target that, those resources into commissions that are managed by and facilitated by reparations, quote unquote, then we have a great chance of changing the whole dynamic of this country, right? So it's how we use those resources. They first must go to human capital development is my position. Okay, um, and this is about the responsibility of the Society of Jesus. Um, so the current Pope is a Jesuit. Hmm. Has he been approached regarding this issue? And if not, could you see that going there? Yes, he has. <laughs> has there been a response? Yes, there has. <laughs> Am I going to share it with you? No, I'm not. Well, well of course, it's, this is a work in progress. Yes, this is sensitive at this stage. Thank you. Well, let me say, too, that uh, a cohort of uh, reparationists from in COBRA met with President Kinseki, who's the Jesuit leader here in the North America and Canada. And we met with him for one whole hour in his office along with his uh, chief of staff. And the bottom thing that we left there with and that the University of Pennsylvania can also do is get the language right in your text. Lift us up one more time as humans, right? In the text. And then that, because students are studying. And if you keep on using this term slaves and slaves, hey, look, look we're the origin of civilization. We're the mathematicians that put it in place, right? We're the scientists, we're the philosophers that everybody built upon and expanded upon. So it has to go into the text. And he, well, he's still running, but we're still chasing him as well. <laughs> so what is that? Could you go ahead and press through? What would be the correct language rather than slaves? Enslaved. We are descendants of Africans enslaved in the United States, enslaved in Great Britain, enslaved in Jamaica, enslaved, enslaved. It brings back the humanity. And that's what these universities has to do. It has it in its power to do it. And, uh, you know, again, it rests with the students. Students in Cobra, Philadelphia chapter meets every first, every first Tuesday, 1609, Cecil B. Moore. I hope some of the students come out and sit with us because then we can create that table, right? That we can then engage this university in a better sort of way, right? And then use that as a model to engage these other universities and these other corporations, but we can design the approach. So this next question, concretely, how do we disinvest from the benefits of racial dominance? How does genocide by ecocide factor into the adjudication of reparations for people injured under corporate and higher education actors? Well, that's a statement of fundamental truth that what, had, what happened to us, genocide, social side, e uh, ecocide, all those things, right? And let me just tell the group here, you know, we got to put some value on the R word. You all can do, help us do that by using the term reparation on a regular basis, right? Use it in your vocation. Discuss it in your vocation every day, right? And don't be afraid to, to become a reparationist. And you don't have to look like me to do that, right? You can do it in your own community. Talk about repar rep reparation across the dinner table. Talk about it on the job, at the water cooler. Those are the type of things how you begin to change society, right? And we, we got to play the long game, right? And then we're going to have to refine and refine it. I want to make, give you a reference, too, uh, to a website called Race, Racism, and the Law 
by um, yeah, Vernelia Randall, mm -hmm. professor of law emerite from Dayton University, right? Go to that site because we're talking about redefining, having the ability to define ourselves for ourselves, and that's the power of change, right? And so that's where the direction must come. And we don't have to get into no tension about that, right? We don't have to get into no tension about just try and do the right thing, do good, right? And feel comfortable about the R word, reparations and reparationists. Where? That's why I, I will end with on that note. And I know earlier we talked about the makeup of the Supreme Court and how that's going to influence one way or the other, how this case, if it's brought, will turn out. Um, and we know that the makeup of the Supreme Court is affected by who is in the president's seat. Um, so voter turnout in the 2016 election um, that put President Donald Trump in the White House was especially poor among African Americans and Hispanic voters and among 18 to 25 year olds. What about getting people to the polls to m get their ideas in that space? Impact. Ari? Well, first of all, we just have to accept the, the reality that uh, while and I agree with the sister that while the reparation was, was billed as an economic piece and that the um, monstrous destruction of life, uh, culture, and, 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 uh, and human possibilities were like collateral stuff. So we got to flip that, right? And, and it's important for us to do that on a regular basis, daily talking and moving the discussion into the public domain. Get it out of the ivory tower. Put it into the public domain. Let's have these discussions in an open forum, public forum, on a regular basis, right? And uh, so all that will help. So I'm thinking that we need to create the negotiation table in the final analysis. Panelists?